the other day when I sat down to consider what to bring for this Shabbat, I did something I haven't done in quite a few weeks. I took a deep breath and thought, before diving in to the weekly Parsha, lessons of the news, let's open the California section of the Los Angeles Times and do the jumble. I always loved to do the jumble with my grandmother Jessica of blessed memory and Eli and I have enjoyed jumbling together on quite a number of occasions. But the other day it was just me and my cup of coffee and I thought first the jumble. So after sorting out the four words and they weren't terribly easy, given, merge, freely, and beside, I then, as is my practice, only then looked at the little cartoon where the final answer will come. Sometimes if I look at the cartoon too early, I start thinking about what the answer will be. So it's a, an exercise in restraint. So I then looked at the little cartoon to ask the question for the final pun or the final answer. And here is a picture of four professional looking cartoon characters. One of them saying, I know we'll be successful. One says, let's do it. One says, we know what we want from a practice. We can be that. And the fourth says, we've got this. The question at the bottom is, the lawyers who had faith that teaming up would result in success were, I'll say it one more time, the lawyers who had faith that teaming up would result in success were, and after rearranging the chosen letters, the answer was, they were firm believers. Firm believers sounded to me like the title of a sermon. Without even getting up or refilling my coffee, I started to open some of the sources with which I like to commune before Shabbat. And sure enough, with this notion of firm believers echoing in my jumbled mind, I opened to some teachings on Kitisa and saw there immediately teachings about to what the Jewish people have held their belief firm throughout the ages. Didn't take far to look. Here was an essay about the astonishing staying power, the through line of unbending belief that somehow we've been able to cling to throughout millennia of upheaval and against every odd. How has it been possible? partly by being firm in our belief. Even when it has wavered, even when at times we perhaps have lost it all together or seem to have, we still are the stiff-necked people that is described in this week's Parsha. Twice we are called an Am Kishe Oref, a stiff-necked people, and oh have we been. It's a paraphrase of a paraphrase, but here are the words of Rabbi Yitzchak Nissenbaum speaking from the Warsaw Ghetto on Parshat Kitisa, Parshat Para, as it turned out then as well, this story of the golden or molten calf. Rabbi Nissenbaum was reported to have said, that Moses said to God, Almighty God, look upon this people with favor, because what is now their greatest vice will one day be their most heroic virtue. They are indeed a stiff-necked people. When they have everything to thank you for, they complain. Weeks after hearing your voice, they make a molten calf. But just as now they are stiff-necked in their disobedience, so one day they will be equally stiff-necked in their loyalty. Nations will call on them to assimilate, but they will refuse. Mightier religions will urge them to convert, but they will resist. They will suffer humiliation, persecution, even torture and death because of the name they bear and the faith they profess. 
but they will stay true to the breed, to the covenant their ancestors made with you. They will go to their death saying, Anima Amin, I believe. This is a people awesome in its obstinacy, and though now it is their failing, there will be times far into the future when it will be their noblest strength. This notion of being a stiff-necked people has in fact sustained us through Haman's and far beyond. It is not an accident, says Rabbi Sachs, that the story of Purim, which is still echoing in our ears and hearts, the real narrative begins with the words, Mordechai would not bow down. Mordechai is obstinate, for there was one thing that was hard to do if you have a stiff neck, which is to bow down. And though it is true that at times Jews have found it hard to bow down to God, over all they have never been willing to bow down to anything less. But the other firm belief that is affirmed in this parsha is the fact that this terrible story of the molten calf that Rabbi Rubin read in such a beautiful and stunning undertone. We are adjured to listen in more closely, even as he reminded us so beautifully that we are not to take pride in any part of that story. But the story of the molten calf and the chaos that precedes and follows it is book-ended, book-ended by an invitation to the covenant of Shabbat itself. That is nowhere clearer than in the verses that just precede the beginning of today's reading. Perhaps these words will sound familiar. The Israelite people shall keep the Sabbath, observing the Sabbath throughout the ages as a covenant for all time. It shall be a sign for all time between me and the people of Israel, says God. For in six days the Eternal made heaven and earth, and on the seventh day God ceased from work and was refreshed. I can hear a few of you over the airwaves saying, Ah, the Vishamru. The Vashamru verses, which we sing every Friday night and stand for them in particular because they are one of the few places in the Torah that we are exhorted to stand for in many communities. And you'll notice that we do stand for them every Friday night at Shabbat. Vishamru v'nei Yisrael et ha-Shabbat la'asot et ha-Shabbat ledorotam berit olam. Beni uvein b'nei Yisrael oti le'olam, ki sheshet yamim asa Adonai et ha-shamayim ve'et ha-aretz, uvayom ha-shvi'i, Shavat v'yinafash. And with those beautiful words, the very next chapter is the molten calf. But on the other side of it, toward the end of the parsha, in chapter 34, verse 21, we are reminded again, Six days you shall work, but on the seventh day you shall cease from labor. You shall cease from labor, even at plowing time and harvest time. Sheshet yamim ta'avod uvayom hashvi'i tishbot. Becharis uvakatsir tishbot. Shabbat is seen by many. And I will confess that I was one of these people who for many years felt this way. Shabbat can be perceived at best as an unaffordable luxury and at worst as a painful constriction. But this parsha and the brilliant minds and pens that put it together remind us if we will but look that yes, between the Shabbats is what we encounter during the week. The doubt, the fear, the struggle, the conflict, the golden idols that lure us down the road to perdition. That's what happens between Shabbats. But for the one for whom belief in this way of life is firm, 
then the seduction of Shabbat cannot and should not be resisted. It is so sustaining that it is perhaps in the way that Achad Ha'am so famously described when he said, a Jew who feels a real tie with the life of our people throughout the generations will find it impossible to think of the existence of the Jewish people without the Shabbat. One can say without exaggeration that more than the Jew has kept the Shabbat, the Shabbat has kept the Jew. I have been known to say over <laughs> now more than a generation of working with very young people to prepare them for B'nai Mitzvah. When parents say, as they occasionally do, what is a way that we can prepare young Chaim Yankel for his bar mitzvah, young Rachel Rezel for her bat mitzvah? And my answer has tended to be very simple. If you do nothing else, get a box of Shabbat candles. Take one minute on Friday evening, light those Shabbat candles, pennies on the dollar, light the candles, draw in the light, give each other a blessing, and pause for one minute for 25 hours, who can imagine? We'll work toward it together. But even for one minute, for an hour, for a morning, receive that gift that is given in this parsha so cleanly and beautifully on either side of these verses, these long, painful verses of strife and struggle. Yes, the molten calf begs us to look at it, to look at our complicity in the ongoing worship of things that are anything but healthy for us and the life of our people and our planet. But remember that Shabbat is on either side, and that is in what we must have firm belief. The teachings of the Sfat Emet, marvelous Hasidish Rebbe, Rabbi Yehuda Leib Alter of Ger, known as the Ger Rebbe, are interpreted by the marvelous teacher, Arthur Green, who was mentioned several times this week in various settings, so I wanted to make sure to bring him into our study together. Arthur Green interprets the Svat Emet, who speaks about this notion of what it means to keep the Shabbat. He suggests that what it means is that through the labyrinth of the week of work and toil and golden idols which beckon us, if we keep within us the hope and the promise that Shabbat will come again, that is the way to keep Shabbat. And not just to keep it, but ultimately share it as well. Rabbi Dr. Green interprets that notion of keeping Shabbat this way. He says, the real Shabbat is not one of restriction or confinement. These outer bounds that we make for ourselves on Shabbat serve to create for us a territory in time in which we are free to be our truest selves. That inner Shabbat, the place where the burden of worldly concerns is lifted off of us and the crushed spirit of the weak is given the extra soul that it needs to breathe, this remains a rare and precious gift. May that be the gift to which we hold firm, to which we hold fast in our belief that no matter what the week brings us, Shabbat will come again and we keep hope and faith in its arrival and its blessing. May this Shabbat bring you blessing and joy. Amen.